Meanwhile, let us begin chapter, well, not that we're beginning chapter 2, but let us begin knowing that we are talking about chapter 2 of Tanya, and specifically talking about the journey of the soul, because we wanted to understand how is it possible, we made a bold statement earlier on in the chapter, that every single one of us has a soul that is literally a piece of God from on high. So we said, that's great, it's a wonderful principle, and we understand it, and we accept it, and we believe it, we just have a question. The question is, if we all share the same kind of soul, and we all are a piece of God from on high, how is it that we're all so spiritually different? How is it that some people are lofty souls, and some people are ordinary souls? And of course, the best part of this each time is that you can go home at the end and try to work out, which one am I? Am I as lofty as I thought I was? <laughs> that's, uh, that's maybe our homework, right? Am I as lofty as I thought I was? So we use a metaphor, and it's a very powerful metaphor. The metaphor says that just like in the experience of pregnancy and the development of a child, as the pregnancy progresses, so the child develops further and further, until eventually at some point the child emerges, and when the child emerges it's a fully formed ten fingers, ten toes, healthy baby, and everybody is happy. The truth, though, is that as the baby develops, certain parts of the baby become less and less powerful. Right at the beginning of conception, the entire fetus is a, well, it's not yet a fetus. So the entire moment of conception, the whole being is of equal power. Every part of that newly fertilized egg has the potential to grow into any part of the body. And then, of course, as it develops, one part of the body emerges as a brain and another part of the body emerges as a toenail. So you see that there is an evolutionary process. And in the course of that evolutionary process, some parts of the body get downgraded. And it's a similar process that happens to the soul. Now, last week, we started to, begin, we started to talk about the fact that there is this evolutionary reality within the spiritual realms. We started to talk about the concept of a networked reality, a reality called Seder Hishtalshalus. It's one of the most important concepts for a person to know in Jewish spirituality. Seder Hishtalshalus. Everything in life has an order. You know, you go into our world and you can see that there are ecosystems within our world. I had an opportunity this week to take my kids out and we went to a nice outdoor space, you know, where you could uh, have your own spot just with your family without anybody else. And we sat next to, I would hardly call it a, a lake. It was like this little thing of water. I, I don't even know what to call it. It wasn't quite a pond. It was like a marsh. It was connected to a lake. And there were these tall reeds. And on some of the tall reeds were the magnificent weaver nests. So, of course, you'd look, where are the weaver birds? Because you can see the nests. And while we were looking, some kind of a creature jumped off the embankment on the other side, from inside the reeds, jumped into the water. And we just caught a glimpse of it long enough to realize that it was some kind of a, a, a small furry mammal. <laughs> it was impossible to, to see exactly what it was. And so there was a debate, you know. Was it a squirrel? One of my kids was convinced that it was a mongoose, which was like a lot more exciting. And I, to me, it was just fascinating. In this tiny little space, there's, there's a whole environment. There are beings, there are creatures who live there. There are insects who live there. there. I don't know, there might have been some fish in the waterfall, I know. There were ducks nearby. There were these weaver birds. There was this furry creature that we are still debating exactly what it might have been. And they were all in this space. And there's a little ecosystem and they all interact and they all relate to each other and there's a natural process and it's all extremely well balanced and calibrated. Now, if that is true of our very limited physical reality, it is definitely true of the spiritual reality. There's an ecosystem and everything has its place and everything interrelates and there are influences from more developed entities over less developed entities, exactly as it is in our world. So that's what we call Seder Hishtalshlus. That's the reality of Hishtalshlus, that there are these dynamics and there are these, these um, layers to creation and things interact and interrelate to each other. 
And it's like a food chain. It's like a spiritual food chain. The higher you are on the spiritual food chain, the more awareness you have, the more insight you have, the more connected you feel. The lower you are on the same spiritual food chain, you may feel less connected, less aware, less inspired. That's the nature of, of reality. That's the nature of Seder Hishtalshilos. So the soul goes through the Seder Hishtalshilos. And last week we learned that you could take Seder Hishtalshilos, this cascading reality of the spiritual network, and you could effectively summarize it as four dimensions. Atzilus, Bria, Yetzira, and Asiya. Atzilus meaning a reality that is close, as we learned last week. It means it feels incredibly close to God. You, you feel Hashem in a tangible, real, undeniable way. Bria is where other things begin to exist. That's actually the meaning of the word, creation. So other things begin to exist. Other things begin to imagine that they also have a voice. Yetzira means formation, where something gets molded into a particular shape, a particular style, a particular color, a particular size. I'm talking in spiritual terms. These are all metaphoric words. So things become cemented into a, a reality of sorts. And then you get to the realm of Asiya, which is the realm of action. And I don't know if we did enough justice to understanding the nature of the realm of Asiya last week because it was kind of the tail end. So let's, let's just spend a bit more time talking about this reality of Asiya. So I think we spoke last week about the guy walking down the street who kicks the pebble into the person's coffee cup, right? Remember that? So, you know, how it's possible that a person should do something that has a physical impact on somebody else and possibly interferes with their life. And you could at the same time be totally oblivious to the fact that it's happened. So Asiya indicates this absent-mindedness, this lack of appreciation for, for where you live and what's What's actually going on? But let's take this a little bit deeper. Let's understand a little bit more about this, this reality that we call Asiya. Because it's where we live. And in the language of the more colloquial mystics, it's the basement of existence. That's where we live. In this damp, dank basement of existence. It's not so bright in here. I remember many years ago, I was a teenager and I, I traveled to New York and it was a big adventure and had the incredible opportunity to be at the Rebbe for the whole Yom Tov period from before Rosh Hashanah until after Simchas Torah. And I was staying together with a friend of mine in somebody's basement in Crown Heights in, uh, in Brooklyn. After Rosh Hashanah, the night following Rosh Hashanah, after Havdalah, the Rebbe would traditionally dish out l l little things of wine to everybody who came past. And it was a magnificent experience. The room would be filled, this big shul filled with Hasidim singing. It was lively. People passed by the Rebbe. They asked for personal bruchas. They, it, it was a beautiful experience to witness. And so I decided after I had gone past and gotten my little cup of wine and the Rebbe's brocha, I went to join the other bochrim who was standing and singing. By the time I got back to the place we were staying, it was after 1 a.m. And they had just done a little renovation a few days before Rosh Hashanah. And the door to get into the basement, as I turned the knob, it was a brand new door and it hadn't been installed properly. So I turned the knob, nothing happened. Nothing happened. Couldn't get in. It's after 1 a.m. So I start wandering the streets of Crown Heights. You know what exactly? I've got to find a place to sleep. So anyhow, I bumped into a friend of mine. He said, don't worry. There's a few other bochrim in a basement somewhere else. I'm sure they can put you up for the night. No problem. I went. And of course, as you know, the day after Rosh Hashanah is the fast, the fast of Gedalia. So I arrived at this basement and these guys were cooking up a storm, you know, because God forbid Jews shouldn't eat. I and mean, we've just had two days of Yom Tov. You can imagine everybody must have been near starvation after two days of Rosh Hashanah. And they were afraid, you know, it's coming up to the fast. So they were cooking and it was a whole balagan or whatever. I don't know exactly at, which, at what time they all went to sleep. But I found myself a little corner and I lay down. I went to sleep and I wake up shortly afterwards. The place is pitch black. Pitch black. I don't have a watch on because I had just come from, uh, you know, from Yontav and have anything in my pockets and I wasn't wearing a watch. Nothing. I have no idea what time it is. Everybody's sleeping. The place is dead quiet. It's pitch black. So I'd roll over, go back to sleep. Now, one thing I've never been able to do in my life is sleep late. 
The next thing, I'm tossing, turning. I don't know what's wrong with me. I can't sleep. It's, a, it's pitch black and I can't sleep. I don't know what's going on. Anyhow, so I try and I'm turning this way. No, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to disturb anybody. I'm in this, uh, this foreign basement. Eventually, somebody stirs after what felt like an eternity. Eventually, somebody stirs in the room. So I say to him, what's the time? He says, 11 a.m. <laughs> it was still pitch black outside. That's what it means when you live in the world of Asiya. The world of Asiya is pitch black outside. That means to say that we are blind from a spiritual perspective. We are. We sit here, we learn a little bit of Tanya. It's, a, it's like somebody's thrown us a lifeline. It's our little glimpse into the fact that there's a reality beyond what meets the eye. But look around at what goes on in the world. It is a world of blindness. That's why falsehoods go viral in our world. Because in order for something to be true, you have to see. You have to have your eyes open. If your eyes are closed, anybody could shove anything in front of your face and say, this is the truth. And that's what happens consistently in our reality. They consistently, they, whoever they happens to be, the great philosophers of a particular time, the media houses of this time, politicians, cult leaders, whoever it is that shapes human thinking. They speak to blind people. When you're speaking to blind people, when somebody's in the dark, you can show them anything and say, this, this is true. This is absolutely true. It's like uh, I saw an article today. Somebody sent an article that apparently here somewhere in South Africa, they've now discovered with the help of Hebrew University, they have discovered evidence of the fact that humans lived on this earth one million years earlier than we thought. And I think to myself, the first thing that crosses my mind is, I, I definitely will trust these scientists going forward, considering they have a margin of a million years of error. So they clearly must be trustworthy going forward. We live in darkness, you know, where people can throw anything at you and spin a tail and tell you that this is truth. That's what we call Asiya. What's Asiya? Think of an actor. You know, when Menachem Begin, Prime Minister Begin, when he met President Reagan for the first time, it's a fascinating meeting. You can imagine that, you know, Begin and Reagan. So it must have been a, a very interesting to be a fly on the wall. So they hit it off. Even though Begin at the time was a little bit nervous, obviously he had had a fairly difficult experience dealing with President Carter. So he was a little bit just, um, you know, distrustful of the uh, American leadership. So when he, met, when he went to meet Reagan, Reagan tried very hard to break the ice, and he succeeded. And it was quite a warm meeting in the end. And along the way, Menachem Begin said to him that he remembered seeing a movie that Reagan had acted in. And, and you know, like the, he, I guess it was part of the small talk or whatever. You know. So somewhere along, I don't remember the exact wording, but Reagan used an expression along the lines of, do you think less of a president of the United States who had previously been an actor? It was something along those lines. <laughs> and then one of the two of them said, but after all, is that not what every politician has to be? A good actor. It might have been one of the most honest interactions between politicians ever in history. <laughs> what is a politician if not a good actor? What is an actor? A seer. A seer, it's an act. It's the realm of action. It's where you put on an act. You get up there. You do your thing. You put emphasis in the right places. You pause at the right places. You show the, 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 the facial expression associated with sympathy at the right times. You know, you raise your voice. You know, it's a world of acting. Asiya is a world of acting. That means two things. That means that the world around us that we are so convinced is real, it's all God's actors and props. Hashem has decided that He wants a reality within which we will have the real challenge of free choice. To facilitate that, He needed actors and props. I don't know if you've ever seen, like, you know, when they do, I was once, a, I don't know how old I was, it was around about my bar mitzvah. 
and I walked into a shopping mall here in South Africa. And at the time, I'm sure many of you remember, uh, there was uh, the very, very funny, I think, was considered very funny pranks of Leon Schuster. Right, Leon Schuster was a local filmmaker, and he had these pranks that he used to do on people in public places. And I walked into this mall, and it, it, it seemed very strange to me that on the side, as you walked in, was this oversized box in the middle of nowhere with what looked like a dark piece of glass, which was, in fact, one-way glass. And immediately I thought, ah, that's weird. What's going on over here? I walked a few more steps, and there was a, a guy clearly put, doing a prank on a shopper. And then I realized that the box was one-way glass. There was a camera behind the glass. So in order to do those pranks, the more elaborate a prank you want, you need a few actors, you need a few props, and then the person believes that what they're experiencing is real. And that's how they fall for the prank. The world of Asiya is God's stage. It's God's candid camera. You know, where he's created all these actors that interface with us and give the illusion that this reality that I live through is the be-all and end-all. He creates the illusion that the important things in life are what kind of a meal you're going to have at a restaurant and if they're going to get the steak exactly right, or if you could shout at the waiter and say, take that back and call your manager, as is customary in Jewish circles. You live in this illusion where you know what's important in life. If my sports team wins the league, you see people like their entire, their mood, their whole reality lifts and falls depending on the Premier League. That's Asiya. There's another element to that. That's the first element. The other element is we actually become actors. You have a neshama. The neshama is the real definition of our soul is that it is a piece of God from on high. But once it enters into the human body, it begins to act as if it's a human resident of this world. That's how it acts. And it has to. It doesn't have a choice because this is what Hashem wants. Hashem wants us to play this role. Hashem wants us to act in this scene. So we become a seer. We become part of the reality. Now I know what happens. You know what happens to many of us? We turn around at some point and we say, I think I'm a hypocrite. What is the point of me doing this mitzvah or pretending to focus when I daven or to sift through Torah knowledge? Because I know who I really am. What's the point of living this hypocritical life? Ah, Asiya. This is a place. That's what you're supposed to do. This is a place where you've got to act. Sometimes you will act in line with your neshama, and that might feel like hypocrisy, and other times you will act different to your neshama, and that's the real hypocrisy. They tell a story of one of the great Chabad Rebbe's that he had a follower. I believe it was the Rebbe Rashab, the fifth Rebbe. And he had a follower who was a very successful business person. And because of the success of his business, he eventually moved away from the town of Lubavitch and he went to expand his business interests elsewhere. And you can imagine walking around with a big fur hat, long black coat, long beard. It's, you know, doesn't exactly give off the impression of being a slick, suave businessman. So he came up with a little bit of a compromise. And when he was in the business arena, he swapped his fancy big black hat for uh, you know, a more modern cap. And instead of the long black coat, he wore a regular suit. And he tucked up his beard. And he went around looking much more a modern man. When he came back to Lubavitch to visit his Rebbe, of course, he looked the part of a chosid. So this went for a few months back and forth, you know, changing roles between the business environment and the Hasidic environment. And eventually he reached a point where he said, you know what, I, who am I kidding? What am I, a hypocrite? What am I dressing up? Dressing up to come visit the Rebbe. That, that's who I am. Nah. He says, you know what? I'm not going to pull the wool over the Rebbe's eyes anyway. There's no point. Who am I kidding? And so the next time he came to visit his Rebbe, he came without the hat and without the long black coat. And he looked like he would have looked in a business meeting. And the Rebbe said to him, you know, up until this point, I was absolutely convinced that you were a hypocrite. Absolutely convinced. 
But I thought that you were a hypocrite when you were in the business meetings. That that's when you were putting on the show. And that the real you was the one with the black coat and the furry hat. And now, sadly, you have chosen to be the hypocrite when you're here. And the real you is the business person. This is the world of Asiya. This is the reality that we live every single day. Looking ourselves in the mirror and wondering, who is this? Who am I? Am I the person who gets excited and inspired when I learn a new concept in Judaism? Or am I the person who gets excited and inspired when I can go sit on the beach? Am I a person whose first love is to be able to reach out to a person who I don't necessarily have a relationship with, but I can fulfill the mitzvah to love your fellow Jew or to give charity or to be hospitable? Or is the real me the person who prefers my own quiet time where I can just sit watching my favorite TV series? Who's the real me? Now it's only in the reality of Asiya that you'll ever have this dilemma. Because if an entity, a being, a creature, a human had to live with the reality and the consciousness of the world of Yetzirah, you'd never have this problem. One dimension higher than ours, the realm of Yetzirah, yes, you'd be absolutely clear on who you are. You would have a very defined personality, you'd have a very defined image, appearance, you'd have a very defined role, and you would know that your role is to connect to God. You'd know that. The Talmud puts it this way. The Talmud, uh, towards the end of the tractate Kiddushin, has a very interesting discussion about what is the ideal occupation for a nice Jewish boy. I find it fascinating, by the way, because if you have a look over there, it does not suggest rabbi. So apparently rabbi is not an ideal occupation for a nice Jewish boy. So there are various suggestions about what exactly you should educate your child to become. And then one of the rabbis says, please, you should study Torah the whole day because look around at the world. Every other creature in this world does what God expects of it and Hashem provides for them. I think here's an example, a lovely example that we all I'm sure would relate to very deeply. A mosquito. Yes? Oh, there we go. Now we've spoken about something that gets under your skin. So you, you talk about a mosquito, right? Is a mosquito a tzaddik or is a mosquito a rasha? So, listen, in my experience, can't stand them. They come, they interfere in our lives, they leave us feeling uncomfortable, they suck our blood. They could work for the government. But in terms of what Hashem expects from a mosquito, tzaddik. The mosquito does exactly as it was designed to do, as does every living creature. So you do what Hashem wants and Hashem provides mosquitoes do the job that Hashem gave them there will always be food for mosquitoes isn't that wonderful they'll always be they'll never go hungry so he says if that's the reality of those beings and those beings Hashem put in this world to facilitate my experience as a human I maybe have to learn patience with the mosquitoes I don't know but every one of them is there to facilitate my experience as a human and I was created to serve God. So surely then if I do my job, as well as a mosquito did its job, Hashem would provide for me as well as he provides for the mosquito. So the expression he uses there is, I was created to serve my creator. That's the reality called Yitzira. In our reality here in Asiya, I was created. Why? I don't know. I'm having a midlife crisis trying to work out why I was created. I don't know why I was created. And why did I have to be created in this century? And why did I have to be created in that family? And why did I have to be plunked down in that geography? I don't know. We spend so much of our time trying to work out why was I created? Was I created to become a life coach? Was I created to become a poet? Was I created to become somebody who would invent some life-changing medical con I don't know. In the realm of Yetzira, it's clear. I was created in order to serve God. That's it. There's an alternate version of that saying in the Talmud. The alternate version goes like this. Listen to the nuance. It's fascinating. 
Ella Lashamesh Koini. I was not created for any other reason but to serve my Creator. Okay, let's compare the two. So the one version says, I was created solely to serve God. And the other version says, I was not created except to serve God. Now, this is typical Jewish gymnastics. We take a phrase and we play with a phrase in this nuanced way. And, and each, per, each perspective, each version is our whole philosophy in its own right. So let's, let's put it into terms that we could relate to. Okay? Have you ever seen those t-shirts that people have that say, nice person, just add coffee? You ever seen that? Nice person, just add coffee. So what are they basically saying? They're saying, I am a nice person. That is who I am. If you don't see it right now, it's because I'm missing something that I really need just to put me into the right. But I really am a nice person. And then you get others, t-shirts, fridge magnets, whatever the case may be, where the person says something along the lines of, don't engage me before I've had my coffee. You hear the difference? The first one is trying to say, listen, please, you might not know, but it's important to me that you know that I'm a nice person. The second one is saying, this is who I am. You can help fix it by giving me coffee. So that's the kind of nuance between these two statements. The first statement says, Ani nivresi. Let's be clear. I exist. That's not up for negotiation. It's not in question. It's a fact. I exist. Then I have to ask myself the question, now that I exist, surely it's for a purpose. What's the purpose? Ani nivresi. I exist. Leshamesh. I exist in order to serve God. That's the reality of the realm of Yetzirah. I'm very conscious of myself and equally conscious of my purpose. So I can never allow myself to interfere with my purpose because I'm acutely aware of my purpose. But if I were to go to a higher dimension of spiritual experience, of divine awareness called Bria, then I would say, Ani loy nivresi. There's no Ani. There is no me. It's not about me. Ani, I, loini vresi. I, the ego, was not created. There is no such thing as me believing that I have a value in and of myself. Ela, except, leshamesh koini. God needed those who could serve him. That justifies my existence. So in the Yetzirah reality, I exist. And now I'll seek purpose and I'll find it because I'm, I'm honest in my quest. In the Bria reality, if I don't see how I'm serving God, there is no other way to justify my existence. My entire existence is in question. And of course, the highest realm of the lot, which is called Atsilus, there is no I in the equation. There is only Hashem. There is no conversation about why am I here? What do I do? Can I justify my existence? Don't I just? There is no I to talk of. So where does our neshama originate? In the Tanya we use the expression there is the shoresh, the root of the neshama. Where does my neshama, me, my neshama, where does it originate? In Atzilus. Chelek Eloika Mima'al Mamash. The real definition of my soul is that it is part of God. It's not me, it's not my name, it's not my lineage, it's not my qualifications, it's not my talents, it's not my dreams, it's not my aspirations. It is an expression of God. That's who I am. At the moment my neshama was conceived, that's what it felt. It felt without question, this, this thing that just came into being is an expression of God. Theoretically, it's not possible, but theoretically, if you could interview a newly fertilized egg, it would have a similar attitude. What are you? I don't know. I'm a me. This is parental material. There's no me. So that's where the neshama begins its journey. Then it evolves. And it's lowered. This is part of the plan. 
Hashem doesn't want us floating around in Atzilus as translucent individuals where godliness just is emanated through us. Remember, we said last week that Atzilus comes from the word to emanate. We're, we're not just these transparent beings that godliness just simply shines right through. It's not what he wanted. He wanted us to become independent independent enough to be to make decisions to have free choice so to get there he takes that neshama of ours and he says let's downgrade the neshama to a consciousness called bria the consciousness called bria we start to think oh 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 whoa look at this 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 embryo is taking shape it's no longer just a fertilized egg it's actually it's actually got these two little pinpricks that look like eyes wow you could start to see the beginning of, uh, of the shape of a head. In spiritual terms, the neshama at this point starts to see, hey, I am a neshama. I am a, an entity, a being. I don't yet know what that means. I haven't yet come to terms with the idea that a being, an entity has input, but I'm just suddenly conscious of, hey, look, I have moving parts. I have intellect. Or whatever it is that the neshama develops at that particular level. It's still absolutely aware of the fact that the only justification for the fact that this neshama is taking form will be to serve what Hashem wants. So if you lived in that reality, you would be incapable of doing anything else except exactly what Hashem wants. You'd be a tzaddik of the highest order. But that's not the goal and purpose. If it were, we'd all be living there. And so Hashem says, let's take this neshama and degrade it further. Not, God forbid, to lower its quality, lower its value, but let's degrade the intensity of its experience. Let this neshama start to become more conscious of itself. So it now it kind of lowers down into the realm called Yitzira. And it starts to say, it's not just that, hey, I'm an entity who's going to serve God. It starts to recognize, I am an entity with a brain. So I'm going to use my brain to serve God. And there probably are other souls out there that will have different brains that think differently to mine and process differently to mine. And they'll serve God in their way. And I'll serve God in my way. And I'm going to be the champion of serving God using the tools that he has shared with me. The gifts that I have will be absolutely rededicated back to him. So if I have a brain, I'm going to use that brain solely to understand and explore what God wants me to understand, the Torah. And if I have a pulsating heart that allows me the sense of love and wonder, then I'm going to love people and stand in wonder of God. And that's exactly how a person would experience life if their soul stopped at the Yitzhira level. And you probably would also be at least close to being a tzaddik. But that's not what God wanted. Because even at the Yitzhira level, you still don't have the option to choose to go against what he wants. At this point, all you know is, I know what I have to contribute. You know, when you read in the, in the Torah about how everybody came forward when they had to donate materials to the Mishkan, to the sanctuary in the desert. So those who could afford gold brought gold. And those who could only afford copper brought copper. But there was no competition. <laughs> they didn't have like this big plaque of donors on the wall to say, oh, they're the gold people. Did you see they brought gold? Everybody understood and appreciated that my contribution is my contribution. It's what I'm capable of giving. It's exactly what God wants. But nobody turned around and said, ah, if he's giving gold and I only have copper, I'm going to donate copper to the other temple down the road. It wasn't an option. Everybody's on the same focus. Everybody's headed in the same direction. So God doesn't stop then. He takes this neshama and he evolves the neshama to now attain the consciousness called Asiya. Asiya is a consciousness where I don't know which role I'm supposed to play. I don't know. I actually have to learn to discover what my purpose is. 
And sometimes I'll feel like I don't want to do, I don't want to do these things. It's too onerous. There are too many responsibilities. There are too many restrictions. Life out there looks so attractive. Those actors are doing such a good job. I want to buy their product. And that's where we have free choice. Free choice only begins once you are invested in this reality called Asiya. So if I look through a spiritual lens at a soul that theoretically lives in Atsilus, I would say that that soul is as alive and as sophisticated spiritually as the brain is inside the human anatomy. It keeps, it's just a life force. It's just so brilliant. It's so clear on what it is that it needs to do. If I had to look at a soul using a spiritual lens, a soul that lives in the Asiya reality, I'll say, that looks a little bit like a toenail. <laughs> what I mean it looks like a toenail? You can't see anything spectacular about it when you look at it. Now, uh, let me tell you one thing that I'm sure you know from experience. If you had to smack that toe into the wall and crack that nail, you'd know all about it. You'd know all about it. But 99.9% .9 of a human being's life, you don't think at all that there's a value to your nail. It's there, whatever. It's, you know, every once in a while, you've got to trim it down. So that's the metaphor that we used earlier where we said there's this development of the baby that eventually develops into a fully, fully, feet, uh, a fully developed human being. And part of that human being is nails. And that's exactly how it is with us and Nishamas. Now here's the interesting part. When you talk about evolution and when you talk about spiritual or divine dimensions, you tend to imagine that the higher dimensions are in another location. Here on earth, because for us that's synonymous, Asiya and life on earth are synonymous. And that makes a lot of sense. Because before the Neshama came into this world, where did it live? In a higher reality, which we colloquially call Gan Eden. It's a very broad term. Uh, maybe a better term that we use often in, in mystical literature is Olam Haneshamis. It's the world of souls. So there's this treasure trove of souls that haven't yet entered this world and that's where neshamas come from and after a person leaves this world so we know that after they leave this world you go also to generically gun aden which is again an oilam haneshamos a, a world of souls but if you think for one second that Gan Eden is an homogenous reality, it's like some massive hotel and all the souls hang out over there and you kind of check in with people who were in previous generations and say, so how was it? How was Judaism for you during the period of wandering in the desert for 40 years? And how about you people who lived during the redaction of the Talmud? You know, it's different spiritual layers of perception. And if it's different layers of perception, that means that you could be on earth and living in Atsilus. Or you could be on earth and living in Asiya. It's much, much more likely that if you're on earth, you'll be living in Asiya. But you have to entertain the possibility that there are people living on earth who live in the world of Atsilus. And that's where it gets fascinating. So, let's say for argument's sake that you meet somebody. And when you meet the person... You know absolutely nothing about them. What do you see? However they act in this particular interaction. That's what you see about them, Asiya. While you're talking to them, another person walks in and it's a family member of theirs. You're both looking at the same person. You're only able to see the Asiya of the person, how they behave, it's your first interaction. The family member comes and can see the atzilus of the person, meaning they can see the real depth. They know what this person has been through. They know how this person thinks. They know what this person's life story has been. You're both looking at the same person with completely different eyes. Or alternatively, maybe something that we could relate to very well nowadays. What's the problem with a uh, with virus? Any kind of a virus. You can't see it. 
And it's very difficult to protect yourself from something that you cannot see. But let's say you worked in a laboratory. You have different eyes. You have electron microscopes. They give you different eyes. You can now see the virus. And you could see how it works and how it mutates and what part of the biology it attaches to and what kind of things can break it down. Two people could look at the same thing. One person sees nothing. And the other person, because they have different tools at their disposal, can see a subatomic reality. So that's the difference between these four realms. When we talk about the evolution of the soul, we're not, don't think of some kind of a spiritual elevator system where you know you get off at your floor. Okay, all the souls here, all the Yetzirah souls, we've reached your floor. Yeah. It's not some kind of a subway station. Next stop. It's a reality that you can tune into. You can actually teach your neshama to tune into it. Because fundamentally, even once the neshama has gone through all of these stages, some dimension of the neshama will always remain in Yetzira. And some dimension of the neshama will always remain in Bria. And the essence of the neshama will always remain in Atsilus. And so learning this idea of the dimensions that the neshama evolves through is not just to teach us how far we have gone from where we began, rather to teach us that no matter how far we may have gone, we always have a way back. That's possibly one of the most powerful teachings. They tell a story um, that there was a group of university students who came to see the Rebbe in the 60s. And one of the questions that they asked was, is it true that a Rebbe can perform miracles? And they wanted to know, what is a Rebbe? And in the course of that explanation, the Rebbe told them that every single one of us has a neshama that is totally and completely bound with God. And a Rebbe is a person who lives in touch with that part of their neshama, and the rest of us are aspiring to reach it. And to make a miracle is to do something in your Judaism that takes you a step closer to that dimension of your soul. So that's really our take home from this segment of the chapter. Next week, please God, we'll also see how those different souls interrelate. How it's possible that there could be somebody who lives among us, who's at the Satsilos level, and if we could only connect with them, they would be able to guide us to discover the depth of our own neshama. But today's takeaway is, it doesn't matter how far I feel that I have evolved, how distant I feel that I am from God, how much I feel that I'm just acting the spiritual or the Jewish requirements, it's irrelevant because there's a dimension of my neshama that will always live at the source. And my acting as a Jewish person here gives voice to the part of my neshama that I don't really know how to, inter uh, how to engage and how to um, connect with. So to be continued with the story, please God, next week of how we find Atsilus neshamas and how they help us.